Welcome back to our Living Prayer Podcast, where we are exploring the seven steps in our pilgrimage in prayer. With me again is Dr. Susan Muto, Dean of the Epiphany Academy in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we will be sharing with you the third step in the pilgrimage of prayer. We will begin with a prayer, Susan. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of love and sustaining support, we thank you as we begin this step on the pilgrimage of prayer for the quiet times that we can spend with you, walking the hills and the valleys, leisurely strolling past a rippling stream or a flowering meadow, and in the breezes hearing the sounding solitude and the silent music with which you treat us to the supper that refreshes and deepens love. We thank you for being able to retreat with beautiful souls like St. John of the Cross who awaken us from the bustling world and invite us to seek the deep silence of a starry night. There we are with you, our beloved, awaiting the dawning of a new day, arising from the pressure of ordinary busyness and recognizing that there is nothing on earth that can compare to the delight of simply being with you on retreat. O Lord, Grant us that we may penetrate deeper and deeper into that deep thicket of the wisdom of God. Amen. Thank you, Susan. So our third step is to retreat. Unpack that a little bit for us. Well, you see, uh, in that beautiful word, retreat, we have the ending of treat. And I think to appreciate the fact that our beloved wants to treat us to new depths of intimacy with him, with the Most Holy Trinity, and wants to treat us in a way that is sometimes extraordinarily generous, that we come to him and he is preparing a banquet of goodness. And so retreat is the reminder that yes, we have returned, we have, been renew- we have been renewed, we have been rejuvenated, but we need to pause and refresh our memory. We need to step aside so that we can start again. So this retreat moment suggests coming to peace, coming to rest, perhaps having an, a pause in our busy day uh, to remember that we are in a pilgrimage of prayer and that this pilgrimage can be woven in and must be woven in into our everyday world, just by something as simple as a mini retreat in the midst of the day. So that's the step that we're really trying to take at this point in our pilgrimage of prayer. Isn't that so relevant for today in the very busy world yes. and people don't uh, uh, make that time to be treated by the Lord? That's so sad, really, because it's as if a banquet table has been spread for us, full of graces and full of goodness, and we choose to run off to a fast food restaurant. So (laughs) I really think that we, we have to experience this third step, if I might suggest this, as a spiritual discipline. This is not a luxury. This is a necessity in the 24 7 world that we have created. We all know that we don't even celebrate the Sabbath anymore. Uh, We don't rest as the Lord rested himself after the days of creation. So perhaps uh, there is an invitation in this third step to take a time to set aside moments that are meaningful, moments that remind us who we most deeply are and what it is that our life is all about. 
The spiritual master who has been guiding our pilgrimage has something to say about it, doesn't he? Well, no question. And you know, the sayings of light and love can also be invitations to retreat because they're short, they're to the point, and they can take us out of the speeding train existence in which we live. And this particular saying for step three is 131. And it reads in a lovely way because it addresses our Lord as my beloved. So you see that link with a deeper intimacy. He knows me, I know him. And so St. John addresses the Lord as my beloved. And he says, all that is rugged and toilsome, I desire for myself. And all that is sweet and delightful, I desire for you. What that says to me is that the soul is bending so humbly in the direction of the beloved that, that the soul is actually in dialogue, in talking to Jesus in this case. And it, the soul says, you know, Lord, life can be rugged. I've got a lot of responsibilities. I have children to pay for schooling, and I have a job that doesn't always go well. So it's rugged. And I know that there are days when I have to toil quite intensely, even to make a living for my family. But I desire to accept that. That's part of my everyday life. But in the midst of that, I want to remember that you're walking with me. You literally are there treating me to the grace that I need to carry on. And so strangely enough, with you at my side, sometimes what appeared at first to be rugged becomes sweet. Sweet in the sense that, you know what, Lord, I can do this with you. And sometimes what would otherwise be just dismissed as toilsome, I can actually have the experience because he's treating me to that knowledge that it's going to be okay. It's even going to be delightful. It will be a job well done. So what St. John is leading us to is a person-to-person -person relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And is there a greater treat than that? And that's what prayer is meant to be. Yes, it's meant to be that. Teresa of Jesus, you know, in her very well-known definition of prayer, that it is a loving conversation with the one we know who loves us. That's uh, one of the most uh, well-loved descriptions of prayer mm -hmm. from uh, Teresa of Avila, an intimate conversation with the one that we know loves us, which inclines us to ask ourselves, do we refer to Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, second person of the Blessed Trinity? Do we refer to him, as I believe we must during this retreat on prayer, as my beloved? It's such an intimate and beautiful way. It's like a divine companionship, so that God is not out there somewhere. But again, as Teresa tells us in the interior castle, his majesty, our beloved, is within. I think those are some of the discoveries that we can make on retreat. And exactly, even God begins to reveal that uh, experience or, or, or begins to uh, communicate to us in Revelation that he is our beloved. Because in the pages, you find it a lot in the pages of uh, the prophets. Yes. And taking a prophet like uh, Hosea, for example, and this is very well uh, known, um, where God tells, speaking to Israel, says, I'm going to lure her and lead her into the desert and there speak tenderly to her heart. So there is that uh, uh, desire on the part of God to, to love and befriend and um, bring us into intimacy with him. Uh, and it's good to kind of remember that because sometimes our relationship with God could be as if God is out there and prayer becomes 
only necessary when I need something from God instead of being that loving relationship, conversation with the one we know who loves us. Well, and one of the obstacles to retreat as we have been developing that thought, that step that God treats us, invites us to come with him, is the temptation to keep God on the shelf until we need God for something specific. <laughs> and as if God is a commodity or an object, take God off the shelf. That's hardly a relationship of intimacy with the beloved. I love the way St. John, by the way, links this saying to a wonderful sentence from uh, the Ascent of Mount Carmel. He says that this knowledge is more enjoyable than all other things because without the soul's labor, it affords peace, rest, savor, and delight. Now, what a thought that is. Because for many, again, prayer is laborious. It's mm. something you have to do. It's a routine that is required if you're going to uh, please God. But this thought of prayer as retreat, it takes us to another place. Mm. It's not laborious at all. Mm. Because without the soul's labor, the rewards of retreat, he names four of them in his one little sentence, mm. are peace, rest, savor, and delight. Mm. Beautiful addendums to being on pilgrimage and in retreat. And of course, that connects with, you know, that um, approach to prayer uh, in the mystical tradition. Yes. And I think uh, in the Carmelite tradition in particular, uh, we kind of received that the whole notion of vacare deo, uh, to be at leisure with for and available to God. And in the word vacare, it's already, you know, to, to vacate, to, to empty out so that I make space Absolutely. for God. Uh, perhaps we could see as an analogy that retreat, really a mini retreat, is like taking a little vacation in the midst of the day to literally vacate all of the troubles, all of the turmoils, to let them go even for a brief amount of time so that the peace and the savor and the rest and the delight of just being with the beloved occurs. So I, I, I have this deep sense that we're working toward true spiritual maturity, and we're only on the third step because we're working toward a much mature, more mature understanding mm -hmm. of the life of prayer, that it is uh, not something laborious and something that we do in a routinized way, but it is ever fresh, ever new, just like a, a friendship, a relationship, a companionship. We don't get tired of our friend. Mm -hmm. We enjoy being with our friend, and it's almost as if conversations pick up where they left off, and they become for us treats. They are moments of retreat in the human condition. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is part of what's happening here. But also in the mystical tradition, uh, there is no doubt, and this is taking this to an even deeper level from the ascent, we are moving with the beloved toward deeper and deeper union. Mm -hmm. This is the way in which uh, union and communion with God unfolds. And St. John writes of this very saying in the Ascent of Mount Carmel. He says, this sublime knowledge can be received only by a person who has arrived at union with God. The companionship, the union, for it is itself that very union. So the companionship, the nearness to God, is what union is. It consists, he says, in a certain touch of the divinity produced in the soul. Mm. And thus it is God himself, the beloved, who is experienced and tasted there, savor. Mm. Although the touch of knowledge and delight that penetrates the substance of the soul is not manifest and clear as in glory, it is so sublime and lofty that the devil is unable to meddle or produce anything similar or infuse a savor and delight like it. 
Why is this important? Because we can be sure that if we are truly desirous of growing in the life of the Spirit, the enemy wants just the opposite. The enemy wants routine religion. The enemy wants God on a shelf that we take down like a can of beans once in a while when we're hungry. <laughs> the enemy can't bear the taste and the savor of the divine. So we may be having a little bit of spiritual warfare here, but it's good warfare because we have chosen to be with the Lord and not to take God for granted. And, you know, we hear again the psalmist telling us, taste and, and see, see. Taste that the Lord see. is good. And yes. once we taste and see, there is often no going back. None. And I think that's what's happening in this step of prayer. It seems terribly foolish to go back. We have enjoyed the fruits of renewal, of rejuvenation, and now here we're being treated to the most extraordinary treat, and that is intimacy with our beloved. I mean, who can imagine such a thing? How can we possibly feel that we deserve it? It says earlier we quoted Psalm 8, Who am I, my Lord? that you should be mindful of me, that you should sit and want to eat with the likes of me. It's like after the post-resurrection uh, moments, uh, he invited the disciples, uh, come and take a little bit of this fish and bread with me. Mm -hmm. He treated them to something extraordinary. So perhaps this third step is more important than we can imagine in the world in which we live. I'm actually reminded again of Psalm 46, verse 10, where the Lord says, Pause, be still, and know, and it's not just intellectual knowledge, but experiential knowledge. Be still and experience me, and know that I am the Lord. Well, that is a magnificent description of what retreat really means. Be still. And you will come to a depth of knowing God that can never be replaced by intellectual knowledge about God. He knows my name. Uh, Isaiah the prophet says, even before I came into this world, somehow, somewhere, I already was in the mind and heart of God. My essence in God never leaves me. It is part and parcel of my whole existence. So when we step back, when we pause, when we are still, we can begin to understand that that's the truth. I am precious in God's sight, as the psalmist tells us. Each person is precious in the sight of God, and God treats us to and reminds us of that preciousness in these moments of quiet. I'm sure our listeners will be delighted to glean uh, some insights from our conversation, especially how in the midst of the business of life, uh, what, how can we make time for being with God? Because that is one of the things I hear so much about. You know, I don't have the time for prayer. You know, I'm, you know, I'm busy at home, and there's just so much busyness and things, some legitimate callings on our time. But from what we have shared and the importance of this retreating, so that we can be treated by the Lord, what do we suggest to people? I would ask that they would dip into their experience, and remember, on the busiest day, they received a telephone call from someone they really care about, someone they love, a good friend. I have three hours extra at the airport. Uh, can we get together even for a half hour? You don't live too far from here. Everything is dropped because there is such a longing to see that person that you haven't seen for a while. So I think that what is important is to create the intentionality to go to the Lord. It doesn't have to mean go into an, a chapel. You can go to the Lord while you're on the way to the grocery store. He's there. Part of the great mistake that so many 
good people make is they seem to refuse to understand that the Lord is in the details. For instance, another great Carmelite that we all love, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. He was with Jesus in the shoemaker shop. He was with Jesus among the pots and pans. He didn't rely on just special times of the divine office. It's the being in the presence of the divine presence that changes everything. Because then life itself becomes almost like a time of treat. We're treated to the divine presence in the midst of everyday life. It ha this presence has to be woven into everydayness. Otherwise, prayer becomes something special instead of something as ordinary as breathing. You know, um, dear Father, if we stop breathing organically, we die. If we stop breathing spiritually, we die. We have to breathe in and breathe out the life of the Spirit. And hence the divine injunction, injunction Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing, yes. That's the way in which we overcome the myth that we don't have time. We have time to breathe. <laughs> you don't even think about it. So why wouldn't we have time to pray? And on that note, <laughs> we end this particular episode and we look forward to the next step. Yes, uh, we continue our divine adventure. Thank you. And thank everyone. We can pause for a moment just again to acknowledge the presence of the Lord who is always walking with us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Well, friends, we invite you to continue making the pilgrimage with us, especially as we take the next step in the pilgrimage of prayer. <laughs>